Thank you very much for coming along. Um, we're going to talk about the topic of values today. And Pascal, you said that this is something that's uh, of interest to you. And uh, I hope that it's of interest to other people. And you're going to be able to go away with a really practical idea of how you're going to be able to put living your values into practice. Now, during the session, you will need to gain access to either a separate device or a pen and paper, either or. But if you haven't got that at hand now, just uh, grab it. Nobody's dashing off, so I take it that you're all fully equipped. Um, and the, the topic of values, I think, is really fascinating because just having that meditation, you know, the fact that we were consciously doing something and taking control rather than just responding and reacting to the world around us. And that latter environment is very easy to fall into because we live in such a busy world, right? So you can just, something happens, you respond. Something else happens, you react to that. And very easily you can find that you're living a life not aligned to what is important to you or your values. And that potentially is a, a problem. Either at one end of the scale, it can just make you feel a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit out of sorts. But at the other end of the scale, actually, it can make you really sick and ill. So it's well worth paying attention to. And what we're going to do is really just dive into this approach that I created called My 31 Practices. And then we'll have plenty of time uh, to answer any questions and talk about what you've experienced as we play with it. So you're going to be doing most of the work, actually. So to, to start with, uh, if you didn't already know this, um, please consider a value that you know is important to you. Or if you've not, if you're not really that sure, just consider for a moment, what might that be? So just choose a value that's really important to you. And if you can give me a thumbs up or something, just to let me know that you've got there, I will just wait till everybody is done. Okay. And Matthew, are you set? Yeah, I'm all good, thanks. All right, good. So now, um, please could you either type into another device or write down that value word that you came up with? And also now, just quickly, you know, 30 seconds or so, uh, just write a very brief, concise descriptor of what that value word means to you. And the reason this is important is because different people attach different meanings to the same word. And for you, what is important is what it means to you. So just spend 30 seconds writing a very brief descriptor of the value word that you've chosen. And by the way, as we go through this, um, you know, this is a, a kind of taster. So don't feel under pressure to like nail it 100 percent. You can do you can follow up with that afterwards. Um, but hopefully you've now got some sort of explanation to yourself of what you mean by the values word that you chose. And maybe we could have um, a couple of examples. So um, Georgia and Andrea, do you want to just share? the value word that you've chosen and the descriptor? Sure, I'm just in a hostel right now, so I'm gonna be very quiet. Um, okay. For me, it's community. So I've been um, managing and putting communities for five years. And so it's always been something I've done. Uh, sorry, it's been something I've done as a career, but I, on this trip, I'm realizing how important it is to me personally and outside of work as well, um, that I have, 
I, I can do life with similar and like-minded groups of people. So um, part of why I'm traveling is going and exploring different communities and came across life itself. So yeah, that's, that's my, in my top three, I'd say. Thanks. And Andrea? Um, <clears throat> mine is uh, honesty and um, the way I define honesty, and this comes from a Buddhist definition, is that when you use your words to say something, you're trying to put an image in your listener's mind or whoever you're communicating to his mind that matches your own. So okay. really to a genuine kind of honesty as opposed to, you know, you can say something that's technically true, but you know the other person is yeah. going to understand it in a way that's not actually true. So genuine honesty. Great, thank you. So now uh, consider your values word that you've chosen and now really open up your mind and think big and identify a metaphor or an example that for you is the epitome of that value. So let me just give you a quick example. You might, if one of you had um, started thinking about excellence, you might say, well, an Olympic gold medalist is the very best example of excellence as far as I'm concerned. You know, some of you, it might not be that, but for, for some of you, it might be. So for your values word, please identify a metaphor. This could be uh, a real person. It could be a fictitious person. It could be somebody in history. It could be somebody you know. It could actually be an organization. It could be a group. It can be anything you want it to be. But what is the very best example that you can think of that represents the value that you've chosen. And if any of you need some help, just feel free um, to, to come on and, and say so. And again, when anybody's free, so so maybe Isabella, um, the two Isabellas, maybe if uh, you'd like to share uh, the value that you've chosen and then the metaphor. Sure, I can uh, share that. Share with it. You all or type it in. <laughs> no, just yeah, just okay. say say which. Um, um, yeah, so mine is um, two words actually. It's resisting paradox um, or resisting the collapse of paradox or paradox, uh, respecting paradox. Okay. I don't exactly say that. Um, and so I guess the, <laughs> the classic example would be the Buddha. But I have a friend also that also uh, sort of exemplifies in his life uh, the sort of resisting, collapsing into. Brilliant. Okay. And of those of those two examples that you've given, if you know your friend really well, I'd recommend that you choose that one to work with rather mm -hmm. than the Buddha. And okay. the other Isabella, which, which value have you got and which is, what metaphor have you landed on? Um, I chose the value of stimulation, which I'm not sure what does that count, but it's only because it came up top of the um this discover your values quiz that was in the chat <laughs> okay. um so i mean the initial metaphor probably brings to mind things like roller coasters or jet skiing but i think it also includes you know maybe engaging in like stimulating debate about a topic that has maybe you know some strongly held views one way or the other and kind of learning more about the topic as well as like other people's perspectives and co-creating this sort of shared understanding, um, I think it's quite a stimulating thing to do. Mm, okay, so uh, as a suggestion, maybe consider um, the best, most provocative teacher you can imagine. Somebody mm. that really stimulates their students, uh, really gets them thinking, comparing what they believe in versus things that they don't know about. So maybe, maybe that is a, a good example. So thank, thank you for sharing those. Mm -hmm. And and now um, with your metaphor, so thinking very firmly about your metaphor, um, and Chris, I'm just conscious that I'm, where did you arrive, Chris? Um, what were we talking about? I think a few of us had sent him details in the chat, but if you want to do a recap, uh, Alan, please. Right, okay. 
Well, no, I think you've you've look at that. You've done a brilliant job. So, Chris, uh, have you got any questions, or are those is that clear in terms of the brief? I'm just reading the brief now. Okay, well, let us let us know if you need any help uh, to catch up. Um, so now, considering your metaphor, I'm fixing very firmly on your metaphor. Now consider what practical behaviours do you associate with your chosen metaphor that mean that they are such a good example of your chosen value? And just make a list of these behaviours. Uh, they could be words, they could be a couple of words, just a list of the things that this person or this example does, which means that they are such a good example of your value. And as you find your list getting a bit longer, ask yourself this question. When you've written a word, ask yourself, what does that look like? And if you can't answer that question, think a bit deeper, become a bit more granular. So for instance, uh, that example of uh, excellence and the, the um, Olympic athlete, uh, you might say uh, they're dedicated. Well, what does that actually look like? Uh, and maybe it looks like they've got a, a training regime uh, nailed down to like the minute of every day. Uh, so you're thinking more granularly than a generic word or descriptor like dedication. And now I'm thinking that you've probably got, I don't know, at least five different ideas uh, associated with your metaphor. And so now bring it back to yourself and think about which of these behaviors would you be really proud if you could display regularly and very, very well in honor of the value that you've chosen. So choose one of the behaviors on your list. And then perhaps Chris and Matthew, you'd like to share where you've got to sure um so my value that i chose uh is embodiment um and this it's kind of just like a i'm not sure i can give like a great definition um the ocean uh, oh, sorry <laughs> i just woke up from a nap so I'm, my mind is everywhere That's okay. um the metaphor that I had was the ocean. It's kind of, I guess it's more of like a personal metaphor. It's just something that I kind of resonate with. Um, and mostly like in terms of like water, I guess. Maybe water is is more of an accurate metaphor than, than the ocean. Um, but a sense of like clean water, I guess, and like, and flow or something like that. Um, so the, for the third part, um, I resonated with what Andrea you said about honesty. I think that's kind of crucial for embodiment, at least at least for me. Um, but the one that I think um kind of struck me the most is a sense of like groundedness or like heaviness. I know like water and ground. <laughs> I guess it's a bit of a paradox or whatever. I don't know. But um, but I said I think like a, a sense of like groundedness is really kind of the thing that matters the most um or the word heaviness kind of resonates more um how do i do that i'm not 100 percent sure um but i think that's kind of i think i would say heaviness actually yeah okay thank you and chris yeah so the value that i chose was integrity which kind of feels like a meta value in so far that, um, I guess I'll jump to behavior because I was still kind of thinking through the metaphor, but integrity in so far as um, being willing to change a direction, like um, 
from doing something that you thought you were doing that was aligned with your values and was good, but you find out um, was not resulting in that effect and being willing to make um, big changes in in life. Um, yeah, um, metaphor was still kind of thinking through it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Martha Beck, but a book that she's that she wrote about integrity, she uses the the metaphor of a of, of a plane. So if we think of ourselves as um, um, a, a complex machine with a lot of moving parts inside it, and integrity is making sure that everything is working in alignment with all the different parts of the plane. Because if mm -hmm. it's not, then the plane crashes. But I'm trying to think of if there's another metaphor that's more um, that's more personal for me, and I'm still thinking through it. Okay, that's cool. And so now you're kind of homing in on this behavior that could be in honor of the value that you've chosen. And I just want to now take you through um, the way that you write a practice. So it's in an affirmation style. So it always begins with I. It's then followed by the present tense and an action word. And so just consider your thinking so far around the value, the behavior that you're starting to play with, and write an affirmation along the lines of, and let me again give you the example of the excellence and the Olympic athlete. Um, they could say that the behavior they want to adopt is to measure their performance to improve. So I measure my performance to improve would be a really concrete behavior for an Olympic athlete to practice in honor of their value of excellence. So it begins with I, action word, use your own language. So it's really important that when you're writing these practices, it's in your style. So I'll give you a comparison. If um, two people, very, very different people, let's say one older and more traditional uh, and the other younger and trendy, and they both uh, attach a lot of importance to the value of relationships. It might be that the more traditional person says, uh, I invest time in developing my relationships or my network. And the more relaxed person might say, I make time to hang out with my friends. Now, it's basically the same thing, investing in relationships, but the language is very different because the people are very different. So the message here is just make sure it's your own language as much as possible. And again, if anybody's, uh, who, does anybody feel that they've um, got their statement that they'd like to share? Andrea. Yeah, so I went from honesty and I came up with someone I know personally who at first was like, I don't know if anyone embodies honesty enough. But then I thought of a friend of mine who is uh, pretty advanced in her awakening. And I think she has overcome a lot of the reasons people are just reflexively dishonest. And so the action I came up with is I speak without fear of being judged. Brilliant. Okay, so what I love about that is that it's highly observable, both by you and other people. So you know whether you're doing it or not, and other people know whether you're doing it or not. Um, it's also very concise. So you haven't tried to capture loads of stuff in there. It's just really simple and smart. So that's a brilliant first example. Thank you so much. Anybody else got one to share? If not, don't worry, we'll we'll just move on. Um, but what, what you're aiming for here is the simplicity of Andrea's and uh, owning it with language that is your own, and it being highly observable and concrete so that you know whether you've done it or not at the end of the day. 
Now, we're not going to do the um, the next bit. Um, I'll just explain what you do and what you might like to do is do this afterwards. So when you've got your practice statement, then just play with the keywords on Google and look for a, any of these three, a quotation, an image, and a song track. And, you know, it might be that one appeals to you more than others, but and some people use all three. And what you'll find is that when you put in the keywords, something will pop up that you're drawn to. Uh, so just find stuff that you really like. And the purpose of these are, are as a reinforcement. So the way My31 Practices works is that you consciously practice just one of these practices each day. And it's called My31 Practices because there are no more than 31 days in a month. So imagine your morning routine where you read your affirmation style practice to yourself, maybe in the mirror, if that's the sort of thing that you do. Don't have to, though. You know, it's up to it's really all about you, not about the 31 practices. But then maybe listen to that song track that you found. Um, look at the image that you found. Read the quotation. And the purpose of this is that it then brings your practice right to the front of your mind at the beginning of your day so that you're much more likely to see opportunities to jump in and practice. And when those opportunities arise, you're much more likely to actually go ahead and do it. Uh, so it's just a way of setting yourself up for the day. Um, as I said, 31 practices. And for those of you who are thinking, ah, yeah, but Alan, what about when there are only 30 days in the month? Well, you just miss out number 31 and you move on to number one. So I usually uh, recommend that for 31, you have something like, I choose my favorite practice and practice. So, you know, you just choose one of the 30 practices that you have. Uh, and the neuroscience of this approach is that through conscious repeated practice, uh, it becomes ingrained and becomes habitual. And so therefore, by definition, you're actually living your values rather than not. And it really strikes me as a rather strange, actually, in the world of wellness and mental health, there is so much talk about corrective actions and, you know, getting people when they're not in a good place and trying to get them back to a good place. Now, what if we didn't do that? What if instead we focused on our values alignment, both at a personal level and also with the communities in which we live and the organizations that we work with or for, so that instead of you living your life out of line with your values, you live a life in line with your values and therefore, you don't experience some of the challenges and problems that cause these uh, well-being issues in the first place. Uh, I've got a bit of a cynical answer as to why there's not more attention given in the well-being space to values. And that is because there are too many people offering corrective interventions with too much at stake if uh, more attention was paid to prevention in the first place. So uh, that's been a, a really quick introduction uh, today. I, I, I'm really keen that we have a discussion as well. But in terms of a takeaway, what I would recommend you try if you're interested to do this is finish off your practice statement so that you've got a really concrete, observable behavior. And then tomorrow, consciously practice it. Whether you can find an image, a song track, or a quotation, that's up to you. Um, if you can, great. If you haven't got time, don't worry about it. Just tomorrow, consciously practice the state, the practice, and then at the end of the day, reflect on the impact that that has had on you and others around you. And just see what a difference it's made, um, because that's the only way you, you'll get an indication. So there's your introduction to the My31 Practices approach and the topic of values. Um, for me, what, what it does is it takes a pretty nebulous topic of values, which are kind of, you know, out there and really nobody can get a grip on them. And it translates them into something 
really tangible that you can get to grips with. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for playing uh, with, you know, the, a bit of guidance. Um, now it would just be great to either get comments from people or questions and open the discussion, Lauren. We, um, we have a question in the chat um, from Pascal, which is, what do you use to Google? Do you Google the value or the sentence when you're trying to find a quote, image or you, sound, something? I think the, the sentence tends to direct you, but even just the key words. And if you don't come up Trump's first time, then yeah, by, sure, by all means, use the value as well. So I wouldn't say that this is scientific. What's important is for you to um, really capture the essence of where you're going with the right words and then just see what you discover. Hi, so yeah, does anybody, would anybody like to offer any questions or reflections on that exercise or has anything come up? Um, I mean, I have, I have a thought I can share, but I'll see if anybody else wants to jump in first. Um, uh, one yeah, of... is it, yeah, go for it, Pascal, yeah. Okay. Isabella raised her hands, it's more formal. Yeah, sorry, she can go second. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> we, respect we the real hand, it's fine. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay, I was just, thanks, Pascal. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask about the, uh, thanks so much for that talk, Alan. Um, and yeah, I really appreciated the guided exercises. Um, I was just going to ask about the distinction between like the individual personal values and that like, sort of collective values. And when you talk about corrective measures, you know, that can happen on a individual versus like, you know, maybe societal level. And if we want to, you know, culturally encourage certain values and behaviors which are arguably lacking in the west um so yeah just what are your thoughts maybe on the on the collective value side of things and should we have an agreed set of um community societal values that should be maybe encouraged or nudged more towards by perhaps the state yeah it's a, it's a great question and i think it applies at a societal level like you've mentioned but also an organizational level and uh, on an individual level because the, the question is really, how serious do you want to be about this? <clears throat> and also, how sensitively are you able to handle the balance between, you know, the two words are very similar for a reason, culture and cult. You know, you, and the, uh, you want to establish a healthy culture, but you really don't want to step over the line into cult. Uh, so it, it really does require delicate handling and I think the the key is the intention you know when people have good intention you often find that the result will be a good one and when the intention is not so pure then that's when there's the risk of things turning out not quite so well and I, I think to answer your question in a straight way um, I would much prefer the individual to take responsibility for themselves and take into account perhaps what's happening in society around them. Um, but ultimately, you can only be responsible for your own behaviours. I know that's easier to say than it is to do when there might be peer pressure around you, but ultimately that's what it does come down to. And if, if something is that important to you, then you will take action. Uh, just to give you an example, I was um, delivering some... Um, a, a group session recently and it was about um inclusion and one of the guys uh, a white guy shared that he had been walking along the street with his colleague who was a lady of color and as they were walking through london um he heard a man racially abuse his colleague and he was shocked he said that he was embarrassed for himself, for his colleague, and for his local environment. And he, he, what he described was that he was kind of stunned and they continued to walk. And then after a few seconds, he realized what had happened and he made the choice to go and confront the man that had racially abused his colleague. So, and the way that he explained it was that you know, he could have just let it go. Um, he could have taken that easy option, but he decided that what it was important enough to him 
that his relationship with his colleague was important enough to him, that what had happened was important enough to him to actually take action. And in that situation, we we then had a follow on discussion because somebody said, yeah, but what about if that person had a knife? And, you know, what if what if they became violent? And he just said, well, you know, I, I didn't really take that into account. All I knew was that this was important enough for me to take action. And ultimately, that's what values come down to. You know, if something is important enough to you, you will potentially sacrifice whatever it is you know that's what values are all about and that's how that's a really good way actually to test whether something is your value or not if you're not willing to sacrifice something for a value then perhaps it's not really that important to you so sorry a bit of a rambling story there but I I think that it it kind of explained um, part of the answer to Isabella's question Thanks, Alan. Oh, and I guess what happened then when he confronted the the other guy or everything? The happy, it, happy ending. It, it didn't. It didn't escalate. It was fine. Um, you see, and that's that's another thing, isn't it? Is that sometimes we've got that voice in our head that makes up this bad outcome, so that we don't have to get into that potentially difficult situation. Whereas, uh, what he said was he felt great afterwards because it was a good outcome. And he feels more confident now about doing something again next time. And that's what happens with my 31 practices. You will find that you'll have a good experience when you do put your practice into action. And that will give you the confidence to practice it again and again and again. And I'm reminded of, you know, people that perform at the top of whatever they do. And my two favorite examples would be sport and music. So, um, you know, I'm I'm older than most of you, but uh, Roger Federer was my hero on the tennis court. And, uh, you know, do you think that Roger Federer just turned up at a tournament and hoped that he would do well? No, Roger Federer practiced a cross court forehand for hours every day to be that good at it. Do you think that the Rolling Stones turn up at a concert and hope that their performance is going to be OK? No, they don't. After 60 years of playing at that high, high level, they practice. So why do you think that we should be able to live our lives without consciously paying attention to how well we're doing it and kind of hope that it's going to be okay? It doesn't make sense. Okay. Alan, Pascal, you had your, you were going to ask a question. Would you like to, would you like to jump in? Yeah, first first of all, I want to thank uh, thank you, Alan, for the talk and also for making the um, this distinction with uh, values and sacrifice. Um, I, I often found like the link very interesting between sacred and sacrifice, and uh, that something that is sacred is something that you actually are willing to stand up for and and do something about it. Uh, I think it's kind of like a for me, like a more grounded notion to that word. Um, one of my question is about uh, that I've been struggling with a lot is um, how many values do you include? Um, one of the things that I do generally is make people tell a lot of different stories, extract kind of like the five values that are most close to them and then try to narrow it down to one central value that they can actually remember. And so like this this struggle between (laughs) uh, how much can you actually hold in your mind to actually inform your life versus, uh, and it's maybe like one or two, maybe, maybe three, somewhere there. Uh, But if I ask people to create five, they will already forget it. Like they will remember one or maybe two and they'll forget the other three. Maybe they're able to kind of like grasp onto them, but they're not really present. And so when I hear you say 31 practices, is it 31 different values? And how did you make that choice? Yeah. So I tend to work with five as well as my preferred go-to place. Um, but if somebody is finds it easier to narrow it down to four or six, then that's fine. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the key point here is that it's about the person, it's not about the process. So, you know, always the process can be flexed to accommodate the, the person. 
Uh, so then to answer your question about the 31 practices, it's just an a number of practices in honor of each of the values. So if you've got five values, you will have six practices for each of the val um, values. That is 30 and then number 31, like we talked about earlier. Um, the other thing I would say is that when you've got something like this approach, you don't have to rely on your memory so much, right? Because you're prompted each day for your practice, which is in honor of one of your values. And I think the the mistake, I hesitate to use that word, but uh, it feels like it, it is a mistake to keep values in our heads. That's not where they need to be. They need to be the way we behave. And there's a fantastic um, saying in, I think it's a, a South Pacific Island um, saying, which is, if it's not in your muscles, it's just a rumor. And I love that because, you know, so much around education and values is about knowing stuff. And that's only the beginning. It has to be translated into what we do and the way we behave. And then finally, Pascal, the, the final comment I would make is around the number and, you know, can you remember them all and all the rest of it? Uh, I, I tend to think of values not in silos or in isolation. So I think of them more as a deck of cards. So, you know, we would never dream of just looking at the, the suite of hearts or just the clubs or just the spades or just the diamonds. They have to all be together. And like a spider's web, really, in order to be the, the deck of cards. And that's how I think of values, because in any given situation, one value might be more prominent or more powerful or uh, more reliable for us than some others. And I was on a, a talk, it's a couple of years ago now, and a, a guy had a question around um, potentially conflicting values. Now, I don't like the term conflicting, so I prefer to use the term competing, but absolutely our values do compete. And I, I found myself giving this guy uh, a hypothetical story. Uh, imagine somebody um, who's got a partner and a newborn child and they're out of work. And two of their core values are peace, so they're a pacifist, and family, right? So let's just say that those are two of their core values. And like I say, they haven't got a job and they're offered a job in an ammunition factory. So what do they do? You know, the, uh, and for me, the key thing is that you go through a thought process and it might be that this person says, my family is the most important thing in the world to me. I will take a job in the ammunition factory. I will begrudge every day that I'm there and I'll feel bad about it, but I'll know why I'm doing it is to feed my family. And when I'm not working, I will be searching for a job so that I won't have to work there ever again. So that's the, the decision they might arrive at. And more important than the decision is actually the rationale for the decision. And if you're clear about that and comfortable about that, it'll give you the confidence to follow through with the decision that you've made. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question, unless anybody else has any thoughts or reflections they'd like to share. No? Okay. Um, so my question is, can you talk to us a, a bit about the difference between values and priorities? Yeah, um, I think priorities is a bit cold. So for me, values are emotionally laden motivators, right? So it's what's important on the inside that encourages us to take certain courses of action. Priorities are more the outside influence on on us. I or that that's my uh, definition of it. Maybe you don't see it the same way. But I think priorities are, is more of a, a technical process that you go through, so less heart, um, whereas values are definitely lots of heart. Okay, nice. Thank you. Because I was just I was just feeling into the fact I feel that sometimes there, if we do not have the awareness, we can often confuse the prior a priority with a value. 
Yeah, that, and I, I think that's right at the beginning when I was talking about how easy it is to get off course. I use the metaphor of a, a boat on the ocean, right? So the ocean is our day-to-day -day lives just tossing us around. Um, and without our values, we just, you know, we bump off one wave onto another wave. And before we know it, we're way off course. Whereas with your values, you know, you they are they really do drive your priorities but the key the key point that you made was that you need to be aware of them in order to do that so that that example that we've just given the guy prioritized his family he knew that was what was most important he made the really difficult choice but he knew that it was the right one because because he was totally aware of his values and how they played out against each other Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any comments or questions or thoughts? Does anybody want to share their process um, through the activity that Alan took us through? Chris, you look as though you've got something just there on the tip of your yeah, tongue. Yeah, yeah. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's it's more on it's thinking through the the aspect of conflicting values and I'm reminded of of Hannah Arendt's banality of evil. Like um, she explained that the people working in so for German organizations during the Holocaust, they like evil was not malice. It was um, that people were just trying to look after themselves and look after their families, and they were willing to make compromises to to do that. Yeah. And I wonder just how much of our collective issues today are kind of around valuing things at the local scale at the expense of things happening at the more dispersed kind of collective scale. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great point. And I, I use um, this story quite a lot. Imagine uh, two aliens sitting above our planet in their spaceship. And one says to the other, hey, look at all that wealth over there. And the other one says, yeah, but they don't seem to respect it very much because look at all the waste that's happening. And the first one says, yeah, and, and look at just over there because, wow, we've got people that are dying because they haven't got enough food and water. They haven't got medicine. They don't have access to education. And the second one says, I wonder who, which crazy guys are running this show. Should we report back that there's no intelligent life form and carry on our search? And to your point, Chris, it feels to me as though we don't have a setup that is fit for purpose to run the planet. You know, it strikes me that we need like the equivalent of a non-exec board of directors that a company has to make those choices and decisions instead of each country. And to your point, and then it goes down and down and down from there, making choices and decisions for their own benefit, but nobody else. The, the bottom line is we we have enough resources on this planet for everybody. Um, why is it that we allow people to be dying? Why is that? You know, we're supposed to be civilized society. Yeah. So so how do individuals act upon their values if it seems like they are systemically disincentivized within the current system that we have? And beyond just pursuing systems change, just in terms of the day-to-day -day actions that people are taking? Like, how do they navigate that? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. I, I struggle with this one myself, because if you think about, um, say, j let's just take the environment as an example. And I found myself recently giving the example um, where you know we can make our individual choices and decisions, but in the UK, for instance, uh, they started charging for a plastic carrier bag. And that's what actually had a massive impact on the consumption of carrier bags. So now that's not to say that the individual can't have an influence. And so I believe that it has to be a pincer movement of both. Um, another example is um, flights and carbon emissions. Imagine if the top 100 companies in the world said that they were going to reduce their flights by 50%. That's going to have far more impact than Chris and I saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to use a short haul flight, you know, for my holiday this year. 
So it, I'm not saying that um, individuals cannot have an impact, but I'm agreeing with Chris that we really need to be serious about um, systemic change and those people that are in positions of authority and power making the good decisions for all of us. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't have any. This is really interesting to me because um, I actually have a side hustle called Humans for Good, which is all about taking action and making the world a better place and yeah, doing good for people and planet. And I think um, I have a few sort of philosophies that underpin it. Um, it's like good actions can add up and small connections and actions can make, like as a collective can make a difference. Um, that imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. Um, and that we can actually influence organizations, we can influence governments as individuals, especially when there's a lot of us saying things, we can, organizations are changing because consumers are demanding it. Um, and I think governments are starting to as well. So I think, I think we do have um, power. Yeah. yeah uh, Maybe, yeah, it adds up. And it's increasing, yeah. Georgia. You, so um, th this book is about what I call the values economy, and it's to your point. Um, what it says is that um, there are three three drivers of this. The first is choice. We're making choices on a very different basis than we used to. It used to be on a rational basis rather than an emotional basis, and now it's flipped. So, for instance, fair trade. You know, people are willing to spend a twenty five percent premium because they believe it's got to the shelf in the right way. Uh, the second is communication. So that's uh, the internet and social media. We can communicate in a heartbeat our views and opinions to millions of people all over the world. And that can gain momentum. And then the first one, sorry, the third one is control, where organizations used to control their brand, whereas now they don't anymore. It's co-owned by different stakeholder groups. And we've had examples of, you know, Facebook, for instance, advertisers deserting them uh, and having an influence on how Facebook is going to be able to go forward. Um, just today, I was talking about PricewaterhouseCoopers in Australia, you know, that they say they're all about establishing trust in society, and then they've abused government information for their own commercial benefit. They're not going to get away with that. And now it looks like that whole division in Australia might be closed down because PwC have to protect the bigger organization from stuff like that happening. So, Georgia, I agree with you that increasingly we have more power and that we shouldn't rely on this kind of, oh, well, what difference would it make uh, to not? Yeah, lose for sure. yeah. And I think if organizations don't change, they're going to be left behind. They will. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's a lot. And if you want to see my um, database, there's lots. Of, anyway, it's little tiny ways that you can do good in your everyday life. So like, put into the chat. Fun. Share it. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's a bit outdated in yeah. Australia focus, but yeah. Yeah, no. We are actually reaching the kind of end of time, but that's, I think that's a really beautiful place to kind of conclude on and I suppose I would encourage everyone from today just to kind of take this forward into their communities their families their friendship groups whatever that you know that word community means for you and maybe do this exercise together or have a discussion um because we're talking about taking the values from the individual towards the collective and so there are often many smaller steps um, involved in that. So I would encourage encourage people to bring this forward with them mindfully. Um, Alan, are there any final summaries you'd like to offer us or anything? I, I think just do it your own way. You know, so I, I really despise self-development books because most of the authors are kind of, I did it this way, it worked for me, therefore you should do it. And I think that's rubbish. So take the key principles and then adapt it to the way that suits you and the way you are is uh, what I would leave you with. Amazing. Well, thank you very much. Um, on that note, I will say thank you to everyone who um, joined us today. Um, we are going to continue the values conversation into October. So I'll be sending more information out about that in our newsletter at the end of the month and um, on our WhatsApp chat so do stay tuned if this has like piqued your interest so to speak 
And also, if anybody feels they might be interested in um, offering insight on a community call to the Life Itself community, then you can contact me or Nathan at, I'll put the, in the email in the chat, at hello at life um, itself. And we'll just have a quick call um, with you to sort of discuss your area of like expertise or um, what you feel you might like to bring forward because we're we're very much about creating these community calls so that the community are really bringing what they have um, and sharing that so that we can yeah experience um, such such the the diverse range that we that we have um, within the life itself. So, well, Lauren, I have got one more uh, one yeah? thought that's just come to mind. So you mentioned October. So in October, there's world something called World Values Day, and uh, I'm attempting to have a values jam conversation every day in october so values jam is a card game we draw a values card at random and then we have a discussion for 45 50 minutes so if any of you would like to have a values jam with me in october then please be in touch and we'll schedule it um, because I, I want to do 31 during the month <laughs> Nice. Amazing. Um, so do you want to just put your email in the chat as well, Alan? Okay. So if anybody wants to grab that, I would suggest you do so now. Um, and I will say goodbye. And thank you all very much for attending. And thank you so much for Alan for, for sharing his practice with us. It was very, very useful. Cheers, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah,